This should be played at high volume. This should be played at high volume. This should be played at high volume. Preferably in a residential area. The following thoughts on Hoppy Hour do not represent Cox Media Group or its sponsoring. Anything you hear may and will be used against you. Thank you. Voted as best local podcast in Tampa Bay by the Creative Loafing. You're listening to Hoppy Hour. What up? What's happening? This is Hoppy Hour. I am your host, Ryan Hoppy. And this next guest is someone I got to network with twice at the Morning Show Boot Camp from Froggy98, the Gary and Nelson in the Morning Show. Nelson is on the phone line. What's up, dude? How has everything yeah, no. been, man? It's been a while, dude. Wow, geez, I'm not uh, I'm not getting picked up by podcasting networks and winning big podcasting awards, but you know I'm trying to eat out a little existence out here in Old Lincoln, Nebraska. Toppy, how's life for you, baby? Right, you man. should be proud of yourself, dude. You are heard in Lincoln, Nebraska. You're on a morning show that everyone loves, man. You're doing better than me, dude. Oh man, but listen. You have got, um, just if I could, <clears throat> if I could fillet you for half a second. Go you on. You this drive about you. That's what I like about you, Ryan, is that, that I, um, I'm happy for the successes that I've seen, and I have worked hard for every, I appreciate you, you saying those things, and, and I am, um, you know, I take pride in, in the things that I've done, but man, I don't know if I have one quarter of the work ethic that you do or the hustle it's all i'm see, good at dude to see someone especially a lot of times in this industry you know when when guys and women have been in it for five six seven eight nine ten years you know you can kind of get i don't know i don't want to say jaded but there's it's easy to do that or you easy to see uh someone else's hustle and then get jealous of it uh, and that's just the opposite to me when i see a guy like you coming in you get me charged up going well am i you know, am I sitting back? Am I not evaluating my show enough? What can I be doing to make sure that I'm still bringing that that early to the business passion that you're bringing, dude? And it really shows. I think it's a case of you not giving yourself enough credit, dude. Am <laughs> I honest when I say you're a bit too humble at times? Um, look, man, the one thing uh, above everything else is I don't know if you can be too humble when all you do is talk for a living. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I try to keep I try to keep that in perspective, you know, because I came from a blue collar family, and my father wasn't military, but his father was military, you know. So we kind of come from that from that you you take what you earn and you put everything on your back and you take care of your family kind of thing. So when I look back and I step back and I see the successes and some of the things that I've had, man, I'm just so grateful to have it happen. Now, dude, we had so many fun times the last time we were at the Morning Show Boot Camp, dude. How about when we kept drinking shot after shot with the crew from uh, BJ Shea Show, and oh my God, oh. we got all those sliders, and I demolished them, dude. You, oh my God, Hoppy, you're an animal. You're an animal. Oh, the liver on you. It's got to be enlarged. It's got to be six or seven times the normal size of a man's liver. Because I'm telling you, every shot, I kept thinking, he's got to go down here. He's got to go down here. And he's a champ. He's, Let's go. Let's get out to a White Castle, bro. And killing it. Or how about when I had my I feet? You, I don't know how you uh, did it. Honestly, you know, I was there. Um, I wasn't working. I paid to be there. So I, I was on my own dime. If I didn't show up to things in the morning time, that was my own fault. But, man, there was Oh, I didn't show I up the out. next morning. And Don wasn't mad either. I was there at, like, 9 a.m. And Don Anthony, who's a really nice guy, one of my mentors, Don Anthony, who is so quiet, goes, you look like shit. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, I love him because he's seen it all. Oh, he's seen that. He's seen hot shots come yeah. in. He's seen kids like you come in and just go be a, sh you know, just a mess. And it was so awkward too. I remember, I'm not the most coordinated guy. I'm a little clumsy. And I remember I went into the wrong panel. Anyone who's, had, anyone who's had an opportunity to meet you would probably say that's an understatement. But continue. <laughs> <laughs> so I meant to go into the panel with like Kane. Fred, Angie, Paul, and 
I get the door really loud, and it's the woman's panel, and all the yeah. women look back at me, and I look like hell. It was one of the most yeah. awkward moments because I think the co-host from uh, Tommy McFly show is having this oh, inspirational team. speech, and then oh, I just guaranteed. and then I just bust in. <laughs> and, and and if you to, I mean to get a real grasp on it, this boot camp it is. Um, I mean, what would you say? Probably five or six hundred people that are all in broadcasting from across the country. It's weird. We all show up. All we want to. All we're all we're all showing up to sit down and, and and learn from some people and maybe trade some ideas. And the room that you're talking about, I know it all too well because there's not there's no <laughs> mistaking when you kick in this room. There's one. It's like any um, hall that you would go to at like a major hotel room. So if you've ever been to a nice wedding or anything, essentially you kicked open the door in the middle of like a, a Catholic service. It couldn't have been any more quiet in the room. Because a lot of the panels, the ones with Weez, were kind of like a wrestling promo. When you would have Weez and Paul from Paul and Young Grand, and you would have yeah. Dave Smiley and Fitz, when you have, and Rick Rumble. When you have all these dudes in a circle, it gets a little vulgar, and it's fun. So if I would have kicked in, they would have been like, ah, get the fuck out of here, and everyone would have laughed. Right. But I kick well, in on the most sentimental one. <laughs> but, right. You know, you you articulate that perfectly because I can remember one of the first boot camps, uh, you know, three or four years ago that I was at, um, a panel like you just kind of described, a, we, a Brother we style, very – loud, raucous panel, was completely dominated by a guy who almost can't even talk. His name is Mumbles. He works for a, a station on in KRBE in Houston. I love Mumbles. If you, if you get a chance to hang out with Mumbles, you have to, because the guy is the most inarticulate man ever, and yet he killed an entire room of just radio D-bags. I mean, that's what we all are. We're all these weird, like, uh, bastard children that didn't make it on TV because we're fat or we're creepy or maybe some of us used to smell, you know. <laughs> and to see this, this stew of D-bags and this one kid to rise out of it, it's amazing. It's just you never know what you're going to get when you get in a crowd of people who love to yell at each other. It is weird how a lot of these panels, and I'm not ripping into anybody, but everyone has an ego, and a lot of these guys are in huge markets. And, dude, a lot of these panels can become self-bragging about how they've been number one in the Arbitron books for 25 years. And it's like, all right, we Listen, got it. I, I, fell, I fell into the same trap. No, no bull. I was actually um, asked one time. I said, listen, I love Don Anthony. He's taking care of me. He's always, he's always been very nice to me. But I felt like he let me onto a panel. I'm nobody. He let me onto one of those women's panels basically because I showed up four or five times in a row. But it's you get drunk on power. You sit up there, and then you see all these people that are supposed to be your peers, and you go, yes, the gods have determined that I will tell you how to run your show. So I, I, can, I can see both sides of it. Yeah, we get it. Okay, you've been number one. But at the same time, hey, I paid my $400 to get here. You listen to how number one I am. <laughs> now, who is a radio guy that you met at the conference that gave you chills? The first time I was there... It was everybody because I was so weird. But looking back on it, right. I think the one that was so surreal was either meeting Scott Shannon from WCBS in New York City or mm -hmm. meeting Tom from Bob and Tom because you go, that dude's on in 150 cities, you know? Yeah, I think it was um, the first person that really made me kind of – that I was taken aback by was a guy at a radio station called KDWB in Minneapolis, and his name's Dave Ryan. And it's not – it was kind of the, the size of his personality in that you know that he's uh, – if you go to iHeartMedia, you know, which is one of the big radio broadcast companies, they have their iHeartRadio app, and he's a feature channel. Yeah. So to me, that's huge. You know, he's not syndicated, but the, the second largest radio company on the planet has him as a feature channel. And he's in so, a major market. Well, and he's been there forever. You know, he, he came from a major market in Las Vegas. I don't know his whole trip, but I know he came from a Las Vegas, and he's been dominating in Minneapolis, market 17 or market 13 in the country. You know, there's 13 cities bigger than it. Um, and what I noticed about him was at the end of the weekend, he remembered my wife's name. Really? I, and I've told this story several yeah. times, and it, it just 
he didn't have to. He, you know, I, I don't make any uh, mistakes. I don't think that if I walked up to Dave Ryan right now and said, Dave, what's happening? He'd go, you know, we're not peers on, on that level. He might recognize my face, but even that's more than I, w- I want more credit than I want to give myself. But it was that two days after he met my wife, he said, hi, Rosemary, how's the trip been? You know, he had a one-on-one conversation, and that's kind of, in that moment, I learned a little bit about what it is to be a broadcaster off the air. And, and then, no, go on, my so bad. For, as for, as, no, it's fine. And as for Starstruck, it'd probably be, um, what is it? Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess this up. Is it Kelly from Kid Craddock's show? Yeah. Yes, yeah, Kelly. It was after, sadly, um, Kid Craddock in, in Dallas had passed. And their show is still going on. You know, they still have the Kid Craddock show. Talk about how, how much of a force that guy was in radio. Um, and she was just there. And it's like, hold on a second. I know you. I, I've, I've you know, listened to Kid Craddock, and I, I've watched videos, and I've stolen ideas from you guys and seen you on Dish Nation. So it was, whoa, there you are. right in, You're right there in front of me in real life. Okay. I think what's weird, too, is Bird knows who I am. Bird Weiss from the Bird Show in Atlanta. That's huge. I'm so tall and he's so short. It's just, it's such an awkward conversation, you know? Yeah. But you know what? That's, and that's another thing that I learned from some of these big guys is you can talk to a Burt. You can talk to a BJ Shea. You can talk to a Fitz in the morning out of, out of the Wolf in Seattle. Who's, you know, this guy syndicated across the country for, with a countdown show. I mean, people know who he is. He's been on, uh, not Regis and Kelly, but before Kelly and Michael became Kelly and Michael, Fitz was on there for the men in radio week. I mean, there's just all of these guys, and the best ones will talk to you because they all um, still remember, you know, when they were when they were new in radio. Like I've been in it for a decade. I've been in mornings for six years. I still feel new in radio. You know, I get starstruck when I see these guys because they're competing at a level that I want to compete at. I feel I can compete at that level. I'm just not at that level competing there yet. But I would kill just to find out I'm not at that level. You know what I mean? Do you ever get a little bit jealous of these guys' success? And being in Lincoln, Nebraska is great. It's a media market, but do you ever Ooh, find yourself a little a bit jaded? It's okay. No, um, I'll tell you what. It becomes frustrating when, um, like in a situation that I'm in, you know, sometimes when you sign a contract, you are you are only in a contract in that area. You know what I mean? And sometimes you sign a contract that only allows you to go to certain other areas. Uh, in my contract, it's called a market out. Okay, so everything in everything in radio is based up on population size. And then a company a long time ago called Arbitron, they they came in and and, and revolutionized the way ratings are done. And then they set up these are how we rank the market. And for me, Lincoln is a ranked market, but there's 300 some ranked markets. We're at 169. Now, for me to take an air job that wouldn't be in Lincoln, I would have to find a market that's size 50 or larger. That sometimes can be frustrating because it feels like you can't, it feels hard to make the jump a hundred plus markets. That's where I would become jealous. Um, there've been a couple of times in the last year that I've really swung to the fences on a job and it wasn't, it didn't end up being my job. And that is probably the toughest thing more than the, the jealousy. I don't have so much of because, uh, what what do they say? Even a, a blind squirrel gets a nut every once in a while. You know what I mean? Eventually, if you if you, you, the whole thing about being in the right place at the right time is that you had the skills when the right time happened. So I've got all the skills I think that I need to take myself to where I want to go in my career. Now I'm just waiting for my right time. Have you thought about doing, let's say, a podcast or a video cast? Because you're a lot different on air doing country music radio. And when sure. we're drinking a beer, you can get a little oh, yeah. bit vulgar. Now I get that you can't do that because of your demographic, but have you thought about you doing know. a it's Nelson podcast so that people can yeah, see know, the other side of you? I, I thought I have thought about that. And, and um, honestly, this is probably where one of my, one of my failings has been in that I have, I've never really given it the, the time it probably deserves, especially when you see, I mean, look at all these reports that are coming out. I mean, podcasting is, I read it in a headline, podcasting is the new black. Whoever the hell wrote that headline, I don't know. But apparently they used to be like a, a, a 21-year-old fashion editor. <laughs> you know, so 
I have thought about it. I, I think um, – I think what I'd like to do to uh, increase my, you know, my online footprint, I guess if you're going to talk jargon, is I'd rather do more in the video space, but more like, I don't know, creative video. Yeah, I, I like the idea of a, of a podcast and, and like a video cast and maybe making a show online and, and then putting it on my back and selling it out there. But I would rather get together with a couple of people and really start putting together some like online comedy, whether that's sketch comedy or it's variety stuff, you know, I don't, I don't know what that looks like yet. I'm kind of been, I kind of been dragging my feet. If we're being honest, Ryan, I gotta do it, dude. Right Come on, man. Ryan. You got a personality, man. You can do it. <laughs> I didn't know you were going to Barbara Walters me onto the couch here. Damn right. I am. What do you think this interview is going to be? Who'd you grow up listening to? Who's your no, influences? I'm glad it's not. I'm glad it's not. I'm I would roll that way. I mean. It's so it's so easy, especially for someone who hasn't really been on a show to make a show that sounds like that. That's why it's refreshing to hear that you're really that what you're doing on your your the happy hour. I just don't take yeah, it too exactly. seriously, man. I used to want to be a shock jock like the Opie and Anthony's, and I actually went up to New York two weeks ago, and I got to meet Opie and the advice. When you have Greg Opie Hughes, who is a notorious shock jock, who has been known sure. for being edgy, say that that type of radio is dead and you need to reformat yourself, to have him say that really made me realize that what he's doing is really good radio, you know? Well, and here's the problem. So many people hear that term, shock jock, okay, and they think that it's this, the reason that Opie and Anthony, the reason that uh, Kevin and Bean and Howard Stern and, okay, the reason these guys were shocking people was more than just they, they put kiss and ass on the radio. That, uh, that's not to take anything away from that, okay? But what they gave people, this is what was really shocking, was reality, okay? They found the worst that reality had to offer, whether it's Opie and Anthony and humping in a church and getting FCC fines, you know what I mean? But this is what people were doing. What the, the way radio used to be was not how any one human ever lived. It was this uh, social outcast that only knew everything, like they knew everything about music, all right, but just couldn't talk to anyone. And then somehow they got behind this magical microphone and the Wizard of Oz came out of them. You know what I mean? And so the reason why some of these other guys were called shock jocks is because, well, some of their content was filthy, yeah, but they were doing something no one had seen before. So instead of learning the moves, you know, how many people just tried to clone what they were doing? It's so, sad. A lot of these guys just copied the hell out of Howard, you know? Right. Right, but then you get that, but that's when you start to look, and that's when you start to find the Opie and Anthony. So they say, well, you know, Opie and Anthony, the only reason you even have room to talk is because Howard Stern came and paved the way for you. But Opie and Anthony weren't a carbon copy of, of Howard Stern. Opie and They're Anthony the only show that dude. isn't like Howard. They're just two dudes from Long Island talking. That's what I love about and, them. And they saw, they if anyone in radio, if you are in broadcasting, there is so much to be learned. I can't be more of a Howard Stern fan. For as much as you love uh, Opie, I mean, Howard Stern, is that's it for me. And I, I listen to him, to him too. Up. I mean, I never got to any of that, okay? So I just had private parts when I was a kid because I wasn't in the Howard Stern market. And then I got a seat that had serious in it. So now, you know, I listen to Stern. But I've always been aware of him since I was in broadcasting. And if you, if you just watch, if you read between the lines, stop stealing things verbatim, but read between the lines on what Opie and Anthony are doing or, or Howard Stern are doing, you can see the way they they crafted their show, and you can use those and add it to your template. Yeah, I just think that radio also needs to embrace talent my age. You know what I mean? Wow, and it, that's that's the, been the biggest thing in the industry. How do we get the farm team back? It's non-existent. There is no, there is no AAA system for radio, and, and the young people – are not coming to radio. Why, honestly, Ryan, why would you come to radio? Other than you have a love for radio and you grew up in, in a, a, you know, a major market and you got to hear legendary broadcasters, nothing about this industry is tailoring itself to your style of creativity. Do you think that's going to help me or hurt me? 
Oh, what are you kidding? It, you can't you can't hurt yourself by learning a platform. There's no there's never going to be a time in your career wherever you end, whatever entertainment brings you and whatever heights it brings you. There's never going to be a time where you go, well, goddamn, I wish I wouldn't have been on TV, or I really wish I wouldn't have known how to do a sports talk show because that doesn't help me ever. Learning every platform possible available to you is only going to to further propel you. It used to be back in the day, you could just be on a radio station. That's all you needed. Now, I mean, if you look at any uh, um, online pulsing for a job, it's we want a complete social media profile and we want ratings and we want to hear air checks and we want to see video content. I mean, there's no more one dimensional talent out there. Uh, the world doesn't want a one dimensional talent anymore. We want more. Yeah. And I think that's the problem with radio is I never ever trash anybody in radio because they're better than me and what i'm about to say i don't want people to take out of context i don't want them thinking i'm trashing radio but they need to start embracing the fact that we need to be a little more edgier again because every market is doing the same carbon copy of the celebrity news war of the roses the prank calls and i think it's driving young kids away because it's not the 90s anymore. We know it's not real. And I know I'm walking on eggshells saying that right now, but I believe that we need to do more shows like Opie. Not where maybe it says edgy, but just talk. You're in radio for a reason. You have a personality. Just talk. You can talk about the Kardashians. That's fine. But enough of the fake sh- morning zoo crap, man, you know? This is what it boils down to, Ryan, and it's not – it's not a lack of edge. I'll tell you that. It, it is, it, well, it's a lack of, of not allowing, this, you're, every radio guy is going to say this, they don't give talent enough time. Now, there are, there are places to be huge and talk, and, but you have to earn that. But here's the thing, that we, the problem that we face, especially in um, some of the larger cities. And this, the, the radio that you're consuming, you know, what you're down in Tampa, right? So yeah. the, the Tampa-style radio, I understand what you're hearing. A lot of the same stuff across the street, on this side of the street, doesn't matter. You know, it has to do with the ratings system. Not ratings, but the ratings system. And, uh, you know, rather than, uh, rather than anger any ratings gods or anything like that, I, I, won't, I won't talk negatively about the rating system itself, but what radio has done, especially in these bigger markets where ratings are so much easier to cultivate and collect and get mine data on a daily basis, whereas in Lincoln, Nebraska, I find out the ratings twice a year. Okay, In Tampa, they find out the ratings once a day. So what has happened is we as an industry have started um, programming against what works in this method of rating system. Now, what that does is, is it brings money into the station and it says to advertisers, we're the number one station. We can prove it. We have these numbers here and that's it. But what it hasn't done is support the audience. It has gained the system rather than finding the format that best benefits the audience. Because, and this is something that you, that you will learn um, Real quickly, Ryan, and if you haven't yet, you should, in a broadcast, you, if you ever want to know if someone has, has a, an idea about broadcasting, Ryan, just ask them what your product is. If I were to ask you that, Ryan, you're in broadcasting. Let's say this is a radio. We're on a radio afternoon show right now. It's not your podcast. You're on a, a signal in Tampa. I come to you and I say, Ryan. What are you, what do you produce? What's your product? What's the thing you make, Ryan? I would say it's a laid back talk show where I speak my mind and I interview people on radio and comedy. But let me say this too. Hold on. I've been getting a lot of advice from Eric Rowe lately, who is the producer of Rolla and Ryan, one of the classiest guys in radio, one of the Mm -hmm. smartest guys in media. Overall, the messages that he sends me via iPhone are paragraphs. It's an honor he puts in that much effort. Yes. I may not do the type of radio they do, but he does give me a good point when he says, you need to format your show more for PPM, and I've been really thinking about that. Sure, and that's kind of the rating system I'm talking about. But before we get too far down the road, Ryan, I just want to bring – I want to circle back 
because it's, you know, I, and people can tell me I'm right or wrong. It doesn't matter. I, this is super important to me. And I want to circle back to your answer real quick about what your product was. And you said it was a laid back. It was a very, it was an, uh, uh, an articulate description of the, the happy hour. Okay. But my answer to you is that you would be wrong. There is one thing in broadcasting that we as broadcasters produce our product, the thing that we make, the thing that we generate is listeners. Because when you go to the store, when you go to McDonald's, what's their product, their food, whether it's a chicken nugget, it's a, uh, a French fry, all of those things. Okay. Because the customer comes in, they exchange money for the nugget. And then that nugget is given to them. Our customer is an advertiser. That's what drives all business on TV and radio, advertising, advertising, whether it's Coca-Cola, Pepsi, or, or Don's Car Lot. Okay? So what we do is we take listeners and we exchange those for money. So no matter what level you're at, no matter what you're doing, what you have to understand is the radio show you're on is the thing you use to get those people. But you are selling people to advertisers. And when people understand that, then they'll have a better – it's easier to swallow the pill of why is radio the way that it is. That's not going to fix radio, but that is what we do in radio. I can now see why Don and Anthony wanted you at a panel at the morning show boot camp. That was really well said, <laughs> you genius. All right, that's enough. That's enough, Hoppy. Now, for people that haven't heard your show, what's it like? Um, it's um, an escape, okay? There are so many, it's like you said, there are so many, uh, everybody can talk about the Kardashians. Uh, we just try to have a little fun. So we make a little noise, we laugh, maybe I'll yell a little bit if I get worked up or if somebody gets worked up, or maybe nobody will get worked up. We just kind of play it how it will go, and we try to be not a source of stress for the audience as they're getting to work. You know, you got to, there's all of this crap that's being thrown at you in the day. We would love to be an escape from that. Something that, you know, when you turn on the radio, you're going to have a good time. You're going to laugh at something. You're not going to believe something that you heard, whether it's a stupid uh, 90s style, a old school bit of tasing each other or, <laughs> you know, or, or eating a mystery crab bag of food, or maybe it is just our, our take on a certain subject. We just try to be we try to be happy, I guess. You know, if there's a tragedy that's going on, but it's not in our city, we'll touch on it because you should, as a responsible broadcaster, you're supposed to broadcast in the public interest. But for the most part, everybody in town is going to be hammering on it. News talk is going to be talking about it, and maybe the pop station across the street is going to be bringing it up because they want to relate more to the upper end of their down. You know, all the stuff, that, these traps you can get yourself into. We try to wake up have a good time for three hours, and get out the door. Now, what is the greatest compliment you've ever gotten from a listener? Uh, the greatest compliment? Like, for me, is people who are hardworking truck drivers or landscapers download my app or listen to the boat and enjoy hearing my voice while working hard, and that's the greatest compliment because I want my show to be an escape, like you said. I, I think the biggest compliment to me uh, is when someone tries to, um, when they try to buy a shot, okay? Because you buy your friend's shots. Yeah. You know what I mean? You buy your buddy's shots. If you see your buddy at the bar and you haven't seen him for a long time, you go, oh, my God, Tim! What's up, Tim? We're doing shots! Life is he's your best friend. Now, I say that I say I say I like hearing that, but at the same time, I if I can avoid it, and I've got my credit card on me, I I have this weird dysfunction where I don't I hate actually getting the shot bought. Like if I can, I will always turn it around and buy the shot for the audience member because it's like to me again going back to the product and the thing that we produce. If you listen to my radio show, go to my go to the advertisers that advertise for us. That's how you can. That's how you can do something really awesome for me. Because then I get to keep my lights bill paid, you know. But 
to see someone want to buy you a shot and to see that light in their eyes, you go, man, I'm, re- I'm really doing what I set out to do. I'm just being a buddy to one person at a time in every car that will turn on the radio. That's awesome, too, because I don't make a lot of money in radio. <laughs> so whenever someone <laughs> offers me a shot, I drink it. <laughs> well, you take it, Hoppy. You better take it. You don't have you don't have enough of a radio job to be a douchebag like me and turn down shots. But never and, and no and don't mistake that you can never once you get to what, listen when you're pulling down a, a modest eighteen thousand dollars a year plus hobby then you can start living the high life okay but when that happens then you can tur- then you can turn down shots but now no you take every shot they'll give you and I'll buy you two on top of it if you need me to send you a Visa gift card I will. I was making that bankroll over at Rover's Morning Glory, dude, and I even took wow. shots anyway, man. What an era. Yeah. yeah, no no joke. I don't know if you ever shared all the way down on your little show here, but, yeah, you probably don't need any shots. Do you remember <laughs> the call of depression and desperation and nervousness and stress and pure anxiety so, and even yeah. a little bit of suicidalness after I got let go by the show in Cleveland and we had now, that hour-long talk? Yeah, because you thought it was the end. And it's so funny because so many of us in broadcasting are knuckleheads. You know what I mean? We're outcasts and we're very few of us are pretty, okay? So we've all just spent – all of this time trying to make our buddies laugh and just trying to get stoned or get drunk or, you know, just have a good time. So I'll tell you this. I remember when I was about your age, something similar happened to me, only it wasn't I was on a radio show. I was given a management job at a, 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 a Midas. Okay, I was working the counter for $8 an hour, cashing people out, and then a manager got fired. I was just turned 21, and they decided to take me from – $8 an hour to $33,000 a year. Well, let's say that that job lasted about two months. Uh, and that's because right after I got hired, we had a big manager's convention at a resort in the Lake of the Ozarks, Missouri. And I got so drunk, I missed two of the meetings. And then the other meeting I showed up and I fell asleep in front of the president of the company. So <laughs> That's basically me. Wow. Yeah. That's basically what happened to me. Wow. And I thought, I thought my life was over because at that point, that was my career. Okay? I was like, oh, this is it. I'm going to be a Midas manager forever, and I'm going to eventually work up to $45,000 a year, and I'm going to be happy in Omaha, Nebraska, doing this, watching other guys actually fix things because I don't know, you know anything about fixing a car. So how did you go from doing that job to working in radio, Nelson? You know, I got um, I got fired from that job, and then, uh, funny enough, the guy who made me a manager got fired about the same time, too. So I followed him to another business for a little while, and when that didn't work out, I decided to go back to college. You know, I was 23. I had failed out of college once, and I said, um, honestly, I got back into college to make music videos, for Christ's sake. So to, the reason why that's funny, I guess. The reason why I laugh is you have to remember that this is 10 years ago. So 10 years ago, music videos were dead. You know, like YouTube was just starting to make a couple of millionaires from the, from the, like the cutie pies and the, and the things like that. But no, it was still kind of foreign territory. And for some reason, I just decided to go back to college to make music videos, something that hadn't been popular for two years. And luckily, before I went to the TV program at the community college I went into. It sounds laughable just saying it out loud. Um, I switched to the radio program because although it was a uh, community college, it had a radio station unlike any other for a college station. You know, for a college radio station, generally they're, they're just crappy. Maybe they stretch outside the campus. Maybe you can get them in the, you know, if you're like in a Boston, I'm sure that you can get, I'm sure Boston has a college radio station that stretches but for an omaha you know a size of six hundred thousand people for us to have a college radio station that's as formidable as a a real radio station is a big deal so i kind of got on there and i got to cut my teeth on one of the last you know hundred thousand watt active rock signals in the midwest and now wr what was it like when you first went on air what was it like oh it it was horrendous it was like the worst 
it was the worst thing that anyone had ever put on the radio. They, that's why they buried us. You know, the first time you guys go out on the air is at 3 o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday, and there was a reason for that. Because you're not ready for any of it. You're not ready for the for the um, for the music. You're not ready for all of the buttons that you have to push. I mean, just when you're a, a, a kid and you're standing in front of – also – uh, knowing that even at 3 o'clock in the morning, you're still broadcasting in Omaha. I know that 600,000 people aren't awake, but it still feels like they could be. You know, so there's all these nerves that you got going on, and you just kind of uh, uh, try to not sound like you're reading and get through all of the notes that you have to say on the radio. <laughs> no, Omaha seems like a town that likes a radio. Maybe it's because the legendary Todd and Tyler are out of there, but Omaha just seems like a town that would like their radio, you know? Yeah, you know what we do? And we support our radio. So the first morning show I ever worked for was the Pat and JT show on a station called KQKQ, Q985. <clears throat> and next to the station you just mentioned, Todd and Tyler, Z92, um, KQKQ is another heritage station. Now, they switched their name about 15 years ago, which was dumb. I wish they would have always stayed as Sweet 98 is what it used to be called, but you know, 15 years ago, it started to get weird and lame to be something called Sweet, because Sweet was like a, an old buzzword. But, you know, that show that I was on is still on in that market five years after I left, you know, and they were on four or five years before I got there. So they're a 10-year show. Uh, the pop station, the major pop station across the street, they've had a 10-year show. Todd and Tyler have been in, in Omaha for 20 20- Two, I think, maybe 23 years. It could be more at this point. I just remember that the, their show had its 21st birthday, not, you know, but a couple of years ago. So, I mean, we will support radio. We'll support our talent here in, in the market. It's, I mean, it's a hell of a – it's not a town you want to stay in, but it's a hell of a town to raise a family in. If you're from Omaha, it's great. If you're not from Omaha, it's just a town. You know? What's Omaha like? Um, it'd be like Kansas City Light. It's almost a real city. You know, it's like, um, or if Kansas City just wasn't done growing yet, like we're an incubated Kansas City in that we've got a kind of a downtown and we've got a, a Westo and we've got, you know, we've got a few things to come to. But for the most part, I mean, there's yeah, not a lot here. You guys so don't have much has, of a skyline. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Our skyline consists of two major buildings. Okay. So we have two buildings that you might see in an actual city. I'm looking at the picture, too. Is there anything to do on the water? Yeah, you know, uh, that's kind of the – if you came to Omaha, the reason you came to Omaha would be for the College World Series or, um, like, the Olympic swim trials. We've been the last – in the last two Summer Olympics, we've been fortunate enough to to, – to secure a, a, you know, a final spot to, to get into the, you know, a trial spot. Um, so that happens at our big event center. Uh, we know how to throw parties out here, but for the most part, that's why you would come here. You're not coming here because you're stopping in Omaha. I mean, it's not necessarily a destination, except for we do have one consistently one of the tough range zoos on the planet. And now before I let you go, man, where do you want to see yourself in five years? Uh, in my last market, Omaha. You know, I think that. Uh, I just. It, I mean, I would not. I would turn down Omaha. You know, Omaha's my home, man. I so could see you I doing they, like Milwaukee, dude. I really could see you doing Milwaukee, St. Louis, Indianapolis. Yeah. I feel like you don't give yourself enough credit for how much talent you have, dude. Well, uh, I appreciate that, and I do. I do see myself. Uh, obviously, I would like my last market to be a major market. But when I say that, I just mean that five years from now. You know, right as I'm standing here talking to you, I have a two-year-old in the other room, and I have a wife with a baby on the way. So um, as little moving as possible. So, yes, I can't stay where I'm at now, but I would like to hopefully only have to make one more move in the next five years. If it's two more stations, that's fine. If I have to go somewhere for a couple of years and then I finally get on to whatever that last market is, I'd like the fifth year, the end of this five-year plan to be Seated inside of a house in the last city I plan to move to to broadcast it. How are you going to make that happen? Forever? I don't know. Um, uh, every day I'm looking for a new opportunity. I mean, I just, uh, I don't want to go too deep into it, but I just um, nearly missed out. I was one of the last two guys in for a job in a major market. So, Are you mad? I'm not giving up. Yeah, um, I'm a little sad by it. If we're, if we're being real, um, I, I kind of gave a full court press 
to this to this job. They say in radio, it's it's all in who you know, and this happened to be a market that I kind of knew a lot of people in. So I threw everything I had at it. But um, when I saw the resume of the person that got it, I can understand why that person would get it, just because of the the markets that I had seen on their resume. They've been in huge markets, and a lot of it is, oh, someone hired you in a huge market. Well, that means that we'll hire you. So, no, you can't. Um, you can't let it eat you up. If you're going to let it eat you up, it's time to be out of the business. And that's okay. But for me, it's not eating me up. No, it, it, it's kind of re with the fire. I was worried for about a day, Ryan, but it's really kind of, it's really got me charged again. Almost like I want to, I want to succeed just to, to be a big middle finger to everybody. You know, I'm the same way, man, because I used to have the worst speech impediment and I've been too content lately and going up to New York and seeing legit people on Sirius XM like Opie and meeting Bennington, you realize how far I'm going to have to work to even have potential to be in their shoes. And it just motivated me, man. Yeah, it's got it's it's um it's two parts talent and ten parts luck. I mean, I will I'm I don't want to say that anybody who has success got there by luck. No, they got there by hard work, but sometimes just having the opportunity to prove your worth it is where the luck has to come in. But again, you can be as lucky as you want. If you don't have the talent, it will not matter. Luck in the end is not enough. Do you think talent prevails in life? Always. Talent will always prevail. It will prevail in every way. Um, That's what talented people drive us. Talented people make us want to be more because they make us see things that in, in lights that we never saw them before. So, yes, if you're talented and you are dedicated, someday your talent will be rewarded. But the 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 thing that I always hang my hat on is a, a cheesy old cliche that I heard a long time ago, and that's an overnight success is 20 years in the making. Wow, I like that. So basically, I'm going to have to wait till I'm 42 years old then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's basically what I'm saying. So just give up. <laughs> Now, where can people hear your badass morning show? Well, it's real easy. You can either download our app. Uh, our radio station call letters are KFGE. It's Froggy981. Or you can just go to froggy981.com. And we're on from uh, 6 in the morning until 9 in the morning um, Central Time. So Monday through Friday. I've been a bad friend. I've been like, oh, I'll get you on. I'll text you four no. months later. Yeah, I'll get you on. But then I never no, got you on. You've been packed, man. I'm just happy that I got to I got to get in before you before you got too big. Oh, I want you to remember come on me now. You get really sad. Dude, we had a fun <laughs> night. I would never forget about you. I, I wanted you this to be not, I'll show up at your house, dude. I'll fuck the hell out of you. <laughs> Especially if you get more famous than me, I'm going to come be part of your entourage. I don't give a, I just need to succeed. I don't care how I do it. The thing is, this is the introduction podcast. We got to come up with sort of a funny way to do it. But I gotta get you on to give your take on the news because the world needs to see the other side of Nelson, man. Well, I would I would be glad to be to be a part of that and and help you kind of and kind of grow this because listen, that's the other thing, Ryan. You never know who is going to like, catch lightning in a bottle. Okay, that's the other side to not making any enemies if you can help it. Don't talk trash outside. Don't talk trash loud enough for anybody but your buddies to hear it. And don't make enemies if you can't help it, because you ne- it's just so crazy. You never know when that person that almost was your enemy could be the person to propel you. Dude, you just motivated me. Have a good rest of the night, and we will be in contact soon. That literally just put the fuel on my fire, dude. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that, Abby. I'm glad to see that you're, you're seeing a success i it makes me so happy to see anyone who wants to be creative rewarded for their for their hard work and i see that in the new signing that you got to that podcast network to your um the podcast award that you got to the fact that you're getting you're getting names i'm telling you you could if you don't go anywhere in radio hobby and i'm not going on wood because i don't want that to happen to you because you got so much heart but just to get, from your podcast alone you could write a book to to fans of broadcasters on how to get a hold of broadcasters. Oh, it's I easy. Mean, you're getting you're getting a hold of broadcasters and getting responses and getting them on your show. I wouldn't even know how to go about getting a hold of some of these people. I just stalk them from outside, like listening to their <laughs> their feeds and Facebook pages, and you're landing them as guests. I mean, 
dude, you can write a book on how to get a hold of famous people. Thank you, man. That means a lot. And then I'll have you write the foreword. You know what I mean? Uh, in the anytime, beginning. Anytime. Well, you want anything you want, Ryan. I'm there for you always. All right. Sounds good. Are you going to the boot camp this year? Uh, I'm not. And that's just because uh, it just so happens that right around boot camp is when my wife is due. So oh, wow. Wow. Thank you for specifying that. We're friends. You kind of leave that out. You're going to be a father the second time? I just told you that like like uh, t- ten minutes ago. Oh my bad. <laughs> How pumped are you? <laughs> yeah, Ryan. Just wanted to just talk, and I said I got one on the way, but that's all right. No, we have a we got a second we got a second child. Um, we don't know what it is yet. My wife thinks it's going to be a boy. We already have a little girl. I don't. I don't care. I love how you it's said so we don't know what it is. <laughs> like it's an object. We don't know what it is. <laughs> it might be a dragon. <laughs> I'm really hoping for a dragon. But she says it's probably a baby. <laughs> we don't know what it is. I love how you said that, dude. You're going to be quite the father, man. Well, I appreciate it, Ryan. All right, Nelson. Have a good rest of the night, dude. You too, brother. Have a great weekend. All right, bye. Happy hour. Happy hour.